So we're kind of at our wit's end and he's really determined I'm becoming that difficult case, you know, and I'm at the doctor every week at that point, like just constantly because it was, you know, just I was struggling. And in the and during that time, the, the bladder thing had gotten intense to the point where it was just, I was in so much pain and I was really struggling. So we're sitting in his desk one time and he's kind of exhausted all options. And he said, this is a really long answer to your question, by the way. I am getting to the point of what brought you to carnival. <laughs> but he says to me, Lisa, how did you find carnival? Actually, I'm probably one of the very fortunate people in the world that my GP, my doctor, actually told me about carnival. Yeah, he was. Um, I, it was only. Be, I've got a really good GP. Um, he when I first started seeing him, which has got to be, oh gosh, you know, six seven years ago, I guess. He was fairly new out of medical school. He was kind of young and hip and groovy, and he, he honestly he looks like Clark Kent, Superman. Like he's just the coolest doctor in the world, and. He was the one when I very first got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and I was very determined to not take the toxic drugs because it's pretty scary what they try and put you on when you're very first diagnosed. So, you know, I was really like, there's got to be something I can do naturally. Now, the rheumatologists, I had asked them, you know, is it dietary related? Is there something I shouldn't be eating? Like, I, you know, always been a very firm believer of you are what you eat. Uh, so... You know, I had tried all different things and working with him, you know, he tried a, a low dose naltrexone, which was kind of like a not so toxic type of therapy. And we were always trying something new. And, and I like, I appreciated the fact that he only practices, uh, he doesn't practice every day of the week because he spends actually a couple of days a week literally just studying up on the latest things and, and getting up with the knowledge. So, you know, I'm so really, truly blessed to have a doctor like that. I was really lucky. But um, I hadn't seen him for a while. I'd been down in Victoria and um, I, again, been doing my research, you know, to cut a very long, tragic diagnosis to complete being crippled in a wheelchair and then the, the whole realm of medications that I was put on by rheumatologists who, again, insisted that this was a lifelong disease. There was no known cause. There was no known cure. And that I'd be on medications the rest of my life. I also had another inflammatory disease called interstitial cystitis, which is called painful bladder syndrome. That honestly was the worst of it. The rheumatoid, I, I did end up succumbing to the sequence of drugs, none of which worked until biologic medication had given me some kind of relief so that at least I could, I had my mobility back, I could walk, I could move, I could function. Um, because prior to that, every every joint in my body was seized up. Like I couldn't move my head from side to side. I couldn't raise my arms. My fingers were like this permanently. My ankles were locked in a 90-degree position. I mean, I was getting really bad, and it got to the point where my doctor, you know, despite him encouraging me and my natural preferences, had said, Lisa, I don't think I've scared you enough. Like, what's happening in your body now, it's not just pain and an inconvenience what is happening is permanent joint damage and if this goes on like this for much longer there's no coming back from it you won't be able to drive you won't be able to write you won't be able to walk ever you know and at that point I could only stand up for about five minutes at a time like to have a shower for example but any more than five minutes upright and I'd probably fall over like I just I couldn't stand myself up so it was pretty bad and at that point you know I said okay well I guess we've come to this point where I don't want permanent damage, I'll take the drugs. So it was one drug after another drug after another drug. Prednisone was the first one they gave me. Oh, my gosh. It was like, you know, the devil's tic-tac, I heard somebody call those pills because you do, you get instant relief, but the price you pay, which they don't warn you about, is incredibly high. I mean, I became very, very angry human. I couldn't sleep at night. Um my fiance and I broke up around that time because not only was I miserable with rheumatoid, but I was suffering from the effects of prednisone. My bone density has taken a huge hit from all that time on prednisone. Then it was methotrexate, which is a drug they use in chemotherapy. Then it was sulfasalazine, then Arava, Plaquenil, which is hydroxychloroquine, ironically. Um, all these different you know, baseline drugs. So what they do when you get diagnosed with a disease like that is they start off on the sort of 
cheaper options really and 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 if you and you have to take them for at least 12 weeks to determine whether or not it's a success or a failure and i was just failing on every single one and deteriorating further and further and then once you've exhausted all other medication options and there's nothing working for you then they'll approve you to try what they call biologic medications which are usually injectable um so my first biologic was humira and I was so optimistic because I'd heard wonder stories about this drug that was going to give me my life back and everything would be great, but it didn't. Um, and I was really disappointed by that. I had a little bit of an improvement, but it wasn't enough. So then they tried me on a different type of TNF blocker, um, Temra it was called, and that was an injectable as well. And I could actually walk. I was, like, so excited because I had my mobility back. I had to inject myself once a week. Um, which I didn't have a problem with, um, you know, you do whatever when you're that sick, right? So uh, I was doing that for a while, but then I actually got really, really depressed, which I knew something was really wrong because I should be happy, I can walk again, and why am I depressed, you know? I went on like that for a couple of years, and then when I came back to Australia, as well as living in America, they put me on that, and I came back to Australia and... I spoke to the rheumatologist here and I said, you know, this drug is working for my mobility, but my mental health is really struggling. And he switched me to another biologic uh, called Olumiant, which is a, a tablet one, once a day treatment. And it was like huge clouds lifted off me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I felt so much better instantly. I felt like I had myself back. But in the meantime, I still had this interstitial cystitis problem. It wasn't addressing that. I felt like I'd covered everything, um, but the interstitial cystitis was probably even more debilitating than the rheumatoid, to be honest with you, because I could function on medication with that, uh, but the interstitial cystitis, which actually came before the rheumatoid arthritis, and I'd had a cystoscopy, which is where they stick a camera up inside your bladder. Oh, it was horrible. And at that point, they'd identified what they call Hunter's lesions which basically means the inside of your bladder is just raw and red and angry and I had a surgical procedure called a bladder distension where they basically fill your bladder as full as it can go under general anesthetic idea being if they could stretch it that it might repair in the right way that didn't work it just went on for years and years and years so I, I'm constantly researching in the background, like, you know, there's got to be a way to get myself healthy. I'd always felt like a healthy girl, you know, I eat organic produce and I'd always been into growing my own sprouts and, you know, green smoothies and all the stuff that was supposedly healthy. And um, my bladder was getting worse and worse and worse and, and to the point where I was actually getting up to pee sometimes 20 times a night. So you couldn't even sleep because you just you lie down, you're like so tired, and then you're like, oh, here it goes again. And it's not like when you have a bladder infection where you feel like you need to pee, but you don't. Like I would actually be peeing like loads, like liters and liters. And it was just painful all the time. I could barely wear anything tight around my waist, the pressure on my stomach. I was using heat packs and all sorts of things. And so in my research on, you know, how to cure autoimmune conditions. I'd come across a few people in my journey, um, specifically with the rheumatoid, uh, on doing a whole food plant-based vegan approach. And there were a few miracle stories out there and, um, and I sort of signed up for that and thought, I'll give it a good bash. Um, I had tried keto for a little while, but I, I'm a sucker for, I've got such a sweet tooth. Like I'm a sugarholic. If I was on the go and I was feeling hungry, I'd grab, a chocolate bar you know like that was my go-to and um I it really had a sweet tooth and I've you know got the dental work to, to prove it so yeah when I went to keto I discovered that as long as I was using you know stevia and all these erythritol sweetener type things that I could make keto cheesecakes and keto bliss balls and lots and lots of coconut oil and cream cheese and delicious things and even though I did actually lose some weight um I just was picking out on the wrong stuff, I guess, but it didn't make any difference to my autoimmune conditions. I would still get to the point where if I, you know, missed a dose, I couldn't walk the next day. Um, my bladder was still not happy. You know, I was eating lots of vegetables and salads and all those things, I, you know. So I kind of gave up on that after a while. And, and for a while I just went, ah, 
I'm just going to eat whatever. It obviously doesn't make any difference what I eat. The doctor's right. I'll just eat whatever I want, at which point my weight ballooned. <laughs> I went up to, I think it was 74 kilos. And and then and I was telling myself, I don't care. I'm getting older. Bring on the wrinkles, the gray hair and the fat belly. Who cares, you know? But then my health markers were not looking very good and I was a bit concerned about that. So that's when I did this whole food plant-based thing and I was super strict. And not just whole food plant-based, but organic whole food plant-based. Organic only. I ordered huge bags, five kilo bag of black beans, brown rice, lentils, cacao powder, really good in a green smoothie, good with cacao powder, almond milk, um, almond flour was something I, I ate a little bit of, um, but but mainly just a lot of vegetables, lots and lots of vegetables buckets of spinach and green leafy salad mixes like throw them into a smoothie stick some cacao in there and a tablespoon of honey just you know power pack i just thought it was the best thing i've got so much goodness in this cup i'm just going to drink this drink this nobody had ever told me about oxalates never even heard the word oxalates before so i had no idea what i was doing to myself but all of a sudden and and the decline was pretty rapid uh I said, first sign was vertigo, really bad vertigo. I actually couldn't even drive because I was like this all the time. Oh, the world's just constantly on an angle for me. and It was really disconcerting. I got my blood pressure was really low. I ended up being taken to hospital in an ambulance because they were really concerned about the vertigo and the low blood pressure. I had a heart test and a stress test. There was no sign of anything there um after that oh there was just a whole bunch of really strange symptoms started happening i started getting itchy skin all over uh, this is going into it probably i was i was a year a full year on whole food plant was no oil at all no fats in the diet whatsoever so um itchy 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 skin but not like flaky dry itchy skin just like ants are crawling all over me itchy skin like constantly at night and then I started getting really bad night sweats, um, drenching, and normally that would be associated with menopause, but I'd already been through menopause like years before, like six or seven years before that. So it was it was unexplainable night sweats, and, and not just night sweat, but it had the most putrid smell. And I was thinking, what is going on in my body? And then I got really bad pain all up the side of my neck, in my jaw, in my ear, every the whole left side of my pain was just so painful. And I went to a doctor about that. Um, they tested my inner ear to see if there was something wrong with that. They couldn't find any evidence of an infection. I went to a dentist and he diagnosed me with TMJ and just basically said, you know, it's just a thing. There's nothing much you can do about it. But I'd been kind of stretching my jaw because the pain was so bad. He's like, yeah, don't do that. So, um, but there was no like rotten tooth or something, which I was thinking it might have been. So then at this stage, I'm back with my normal GP, the good one, and um, up in Queensland. And he actually got really concerned because one of the black box warnings on the medication that I'm, you know, I was on for the rheumatoid is lymphoma, high risk of lymphoma. So there was a concern that some of these signs might be looking like a possible lymphoma. So he sent me off for a full, you know, scan of my, obviously my neck, throat area for signs of lymphoma, blood tests and all that kind of stuff. Nothing. There's, there's no sign of anything like that. So we're kind of at our wit's end and he's really determined I'm becoming that difficult case, you know, and I'm at the doctor every week at that point, like just constantly because it was, you know, just... I was struggling and in the and during that time the the bladder thing had gotten intense to the point where it was just I was in so much pain and I was really struggling so we're sitting in his desk one time and he's kind of exhausted all options and he said this is a really long answer to your question by the way I am getting to the point of what brought you to carnival <laughs> but he says to me have you thought about eating meat that that's all he said very subtle and I said no and he's like well why not and I said well because you know I've done my research I, I know about diets and I know about cellular mimicry you know autoimmune conditions are caused by 
um, permeating gut that leaks animal proteins into it and then your body attacks the animal proteins which then it starts attacking yours because it doesn't know the difference between animal protein and human protein. That's what I've been told. Patterson program for rheumatoid arthritis, the McDougall program, they all say that. Um, and they also say the fat, what's McDougall say? The fat you eat is the fat you wear. So, you know, I've been an up and down weight kind of person. I was like, mm, I'm, you know, so that was my response to him. Have you thought about? And all he said was, and we've since spoken about it, and he's told me openly um, that, that he's limited on what he can actually say. Um, but he just said, well, I've heard some really good, things happening with the carnivore people on the carnivore diet are getting some pretty good results and I just laughed at him I said that's ridiculous you know like and he's like well you know I'm just saying it you know but yeah I know you you'll go off and do your own research and and see what you think you know now so hell-bent on vegetables are the best possible thing for my body and meat you know, I didn't even like the taste of it. I've never been one of those people that salivates over a steak. You know, people go, oh, a juicy steak, and I'd be like, Bleh. I mean, even growing up, I was mainly vegetarian. During my whole, like, years raising my children, predominantly vegetarian, to be honest with you. I just, I'd never had a taste for meat. I never liked it. People go nuts over bacon. Oh, I thought bacon was disgusting. I was like, the smell of cooking bacon smells like, bo to me like i was just so repulsed by it you know i would never want to eat it so there was something there that was just like no this isn't for me you know i know people talk about blood types and things like that you know i am a blood type which is meant to be the more vegetarian people say oh people are more carnivore you know but it's just what you get used to it really is so I had this sort of aversion to it, but I came home and I started looking up on YouTube and I came across your channel uh, and all the big name people, you know, like the Ken Berry and Dr. Chaffee and all those, you know, big, big YouTubers, right? And I'm sitting there going, they're probably sponsored by the meat board. I reckon, I reckon they're all sponsored by some meat production company and that's why they're pushing this ridiculous diet, you know, like, seriously i was so so skeptical but then i when i watch a video i'm not just listening to what people are saying i start reading the comments underneath and i started reading the comments underneath and this is why i love your channel so much because you're giving a platform to those people that don't necessarily want to start their own channel you know they've got other things going on but you're letting people like me tell our actual success stories and I really truly think that it's the genuine raw people who don't want a million subscribers on YouTube are just going about their daily life those comments under those videos were pretty hard to ignore you know it was just one after another after another. like there was there was a few people saying oh I tried it and it didn't work and then everyone would have an answer well how long were you on it you know did you wait for the adaptation phase did you eat enough fat did you eat enough this you know like everyone was suggesting like there are ways that you could make it work if don't give up so soon you know keep at it and I was like wow there's something in this you know I knew that the first thing I had to give up was sugar absolutely sugar was just never going to be a good idea under any circumstances and i've watched quite a few videos about that so i cut the sugar out because i knew that would be the hardest part for me because the addictive quality of it and but i was still having one tablespoon of raw manuka honey organic beautiful from the co-op shop up the road and um and i'd have that in my smoothie every day but i was still having my smoothies but then on my doctor's suggestion i thought well this eating meat thing is going to take some getting used to. Uh, there was a sausage seller who, who used to make like no additive sausages, just meat. And once a week he'd set up a thing in town and you could, you know, I used to walk past there and, and I'd buy a sausage. He normally would, he, he'd, he would, you know, bring out the barbecue and fry up a whole different bunch of sausages and you could have it on a bread with relish or whatever, but I'd just get just the sausage, just the sausage. And I started doing that once a week. Once a week, one sausage, and I'm still having my tablespoon of honey. About two months into it, I decided it was time for the honey to go and to start replacing more meals with meat. And I started doing things like, oh, my gosh, I think I ate every known meat under the sun. 
I had the local IGA used to cook up pork belly roast every day. So I'd go and get big chunks of pork belly. I started, oh my gosh, my poor system, I tell you, it, that pork belly. <laughs> Not having had any fats in my diet for a really long time, you can imagine what the reaction was, right? It was like, where's the nearest toilet? <laughs> it is like straight through me. I was like, talk about a back cleanse. It was like, because my body didn't know what to do with that, you know, and there is that adapting kind of phase where you just kind of I, I often tell people you've been running on one kind of engine most of your life it's a carb glucose fueled engine and all of a sudden you're just going to go completely change your fuel source you know the engine's going to go eh, eh, what do i do with this you know and, and and but it does adapt and so i feel like i tried to transition as slowly as possible but that initial kind of now I'm all in, um, it, it, it still was a shock to my system and it really was. And there was not a lot of information I could find about that because everybody that's touting carnivore, it's kind of like childbirth. Once you've gone through the other side of it and you've got the beautiful baby in your arms, you forget how traumatising the actual process to get it there was. You know, it's like let's talk some more about the fact that this is not a fun process and that people are probably going, this diet's shit. Like, I'm not going to do this, you know, like pun intended there, you know, like it, it's, it's not working. It's horrible. I can't live like this, you know. But I was like, because I do that when I'm determined to do it and, and, and I decided, you know, I'd give myself 30 days. 30 days, I'll try this ridiculous diet, I'll prove my doctor wrong and that'll be the end of it you know but I, I wasn't going to veer off it but I was eating chicken and bacon and um steaks and mints and all the varieties of meat I stuffed my face I figured if I couldn't have the things I was used to and I was used to being hungry all the time because plant-based vegan makes you really hungry all the time you're constantly having to eat so I was just stuffing my face with all this food because I figured that was how I'd get through it. I'd get through it by just feeling like I'm feasting, absolutely feasting. So I ate and I ate and I ate and I ate. And I also did something a little bit naughty, which the doctor was not real impressed with me about. I thought the only way I'm really going to know if this diet actually works is if I stop taking my medication because the medication is controlling the rheumatoid, right? So if, if, I stopped taking it, it would literally not I'd notice the effects the next day normally. So I stopped taking it. Crazy thing happened about three days into full 100% carnivore, no more plant products whatsoever. I had this incredible feeling in my head of clarity. Like I just, I'd noticed, because that was the other thing, I'd been really struggling with anxiety and depression and brain fog and insomnia. Those were the many symptoms that I'd been going to my doctor about. Like, I just don't feel good, you know. It was just this like a cloud kind of feeling of, I don't know, the things that used to annoy me or bug me or irritate me just didn't seem to anymore. And I was like, this is interesting. Like, wonder what that's about. Um, Just to clarify, this is before you've, this is while you're still taking the meds, um, but you're just three days in. No, no, I'd stopped taking the meds, stopped okay. taking the meds and gone full carnival on the same day. So, yeah. So I still was getting the bladder symptoms quite strongly at that point. Um, in fact, for the first week, it actually increased in intensity really badly, like really bad. In fact, I felt so like I was peeing shards of glass you know so, sorry to be crude but you you're getting it from both ends at this point right yeah oh yeah i mean all ends and and my head is is all fuzzy wuzzy it was yeah it was interesting but uh and and i just you know i just figured there's a bunch of crap in my system that i just need to expel from whatever way it needs to come out there's a sort of a cleansing process happening but pretty quickly into it about the three week mark i think it was where i hadn't had a flare-up of rheumatoid the bladder had just quietened right down and i felt really good i was like hmm 
okay, we're nearly at the 30-day mark, you know. And at the 30-day mark, the doctor had said to me, you know, you probably start introducing some non-kind of inflammatory type things, you know. I get I get to the 30-day mark and by then I'm feeling so great. I don't want to change a thing. And I'm just like, you know what, no, um, I'm going to keep going for a little while. And then I discovered at six weeks in, Oxalate dumping, yay. That was fun. Yeah, that was really fun. If, if anyone wants, actually, you know what? I had another one last week. Randomly, we're 10 months in and out of the blue, another oxalate dump. I thought I was seriously over it. But you've got to imagine consuming probably 3,000 milligrams of oxalates on an average day when your body can only handle 150 milligrams. I did the math. I added up what I'd been eating and it shocked me when I found out that 4,000 milligrams a day will actually kill you. Um, it's no wonder I had all those symptoms. But the oxalate dumping, how do you know it's happening? Oh, well, you know, I'm not afraid to go into graphic detail here. I know it's happening because the first thing was that I started craving dairy and I hadn't really been eating dairy at that point, like maybe a little bit of cheese here and there. I started really craving dairy and I would consume it in huge amounts, a whole tub of cream cheese, like a big chunk of cheese like I just really wanted dairy and I kind of thought to myself well I'm not trying to lose weight it doesn't really matter if I eat a bit of you know dairy. obviously I'm not drinking milk because I've always been lactose intolerant so I've never really been a big milk person but if it's some if it's a type of dairy that's gone through a fermentation process of some sort where the you know the lactose is basically consumed by the um cultures you know like a, a good aged cheese or a, a you know plain um, yeah, I actually could get lactose-free cream cheese as well. But, yeah, I just started over-consuming that. That was the first sign. Then what would happen would be what came out the other end would burn my butt, like burn my butt, like fire. Like I was like, whoa, okay. And at that stage I started looking it up, you know, what is going on here and find out about oxalates. And I was like, oh, my goodness, that makes so much sense. Well, if it is burning my butt then that's probably what was going on in my bladder, you know, like that's probably what all that pain was and it, it was just burnt. And then I started getting scabby sores all over my scalp and I went to the doctor, I went to two different doctors about that because I was somewhere, staying somewhere else at one point and these itchy scabs, oh, my, so itchy. I was just like, this is, this is about, I don't know, probably about eight, six to eight weeks into it. It was oxalate dumping. I would scratch my head and these golden crystals would come out. And like I said, I just had another one last week and blow me down. I actually I actually grabbed one of these crystals and put it in a little plastic container because one day I want somebody to look at it under a microscope and confirm for me that that actually is an oxalate crystal. Like it was so strange. And the doctors weren't sure what it was. It's not psoriasis. It's not seborrheic dermatitis. And, and then, you know, I'm Googling golden crystals coming out of scabby sores on my scalp you know to find if anyone else has had this experience and I couldn't find anybody but people had talked about them coming out of their skin and also their eyes and I had that too like I wake up in the morning and you know how sometimes you think it's sleep in your eyes but these were real grainy kind of hard little like sand like things in your eyes when you wake up in the morning so I had all that going on and that would last probably about a week or so where it's a bit uncomfortable but again I knew that it was a process that my body just at that stage having done my research it's a process that you know of, of getting rid of the basically overdose of, of oxalate based foods that I'd been eating up until that point and um and then yeah I kept going and I didn't lose weight at all for the first probably three months um was not my goal I I just wanted healing. I was really, I want to heal my body. And I, I actually don't understand why people do it just for weight loss. I, I don't think, I, I don't, that's not a, a really a goal for me. Like, I don't think that would have been a big enough why. You know, we talk about our whys. Um, if I just wanted to lose weight, I probably would have gone to the gym or something, which I did go to the gym anyway, but that's more fitness and health. Like health was, health was my priority. I wanted to sleep through the night. I wanted to, get to sleep when I go to bed, not lie there all awake for hours on end and try and survive on a couple of hours sleep a night. Like 
I wanted to get rid of the pain. I wanted to function as a human being and I wasn't. I was just a shell of, of my former self. So, yeah, by, by, by six months, three to six months, all of a sudden my body started transforming and it was sort of like I wasn't even trying. I was eating plenty. Like, and the amount of fats I was eating, like, is what we deem, like, unhealthy normally, you know. Like, I'm having huge chunks of butter in my eggs and I'm cooking everything in tallow and bacon grease and lard. I started eating really strange things that would have never occurred to me in my previous meat aversion state, like liver. All of a sudden I thought liver was a good idea, you know, fry up some liver. And I used to cut it into strips, get it fresh from the butcher, cut it into strips, um, beef liver. I didn't really like lamb liver. It was kind of a bit, mm. but beef liver was delicious. If you cook the bacon up first, make sure there was heaps of grease in the pan and slice it up like little beef strips. And and I ate it and I was like, this is delicious. This tastes so good, you know. So I could still do that probably about once every few weeks. I'll go up, you know, because you buy it. I used to say the which you can cut in half because like the beef liver's this big. I can't eat the whole thing, you know. And once you get it, you've got to eat it straight away within a couple of days. You can't kind of, you know, make it last like some things. So I don't do that all the time. But I know whenever I need it because I just go, oh, that's what I'm going to have right now. And I don't really eat a lot of bacon anymore either, to be honest with you, because I don't know why. It's just I'm different kind of fats I guess I'm, I'm definitely more into the fatty steaks and uh, scotch fillet and eggs and butter mainly and occasional liver and sardines I've been really getting into sardines which I used to think were disgusting like so all the all those um objections that I hear other people saying to me now like because of course you become like this total evangelist for carnivore, don't you? You know, you hear your friend talking about this ailment and this ailment and that ailment, and I'm like, oh, you know, have you thought about, you know? Because, yeah, because I wish somebody had told me a long time ago so I didn't suffer all those years. I feel like saying, like, oh, I can give you advice that would make your life so awesome, and everyone's got their objections. It's like, and, you know, having been in sales before, you know, you understand about objections, right? But sometimes it's just like, look, I, I can't even. I'm, I'm, you know, you find it when you're ready, I guess. But I just hope that even if people, everyone has been telling me, you look really amazing. You look really healthy. Your skin, like someone said to me the other day, and I had no makeup on whatsoever, your skin is looking really amazing right now. Like, do you think that's the carnivore diet? Do you think it does something to your skin? And I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. <laughs> You know, so maybe just the little seeds of, of, you know, planting that idea in their mind will make them eventually, when their why gets big enough, that they'll, they'll be like me and they'll just give it a go. Because, yeah, the funny thing I notice too, and I see so many women especially, like you get to this middle age kind of phase. I'm 55. So you start getting a bit podgy, you know, just, and I was kind of like, it's cool, punch is fine, you know, it's an aging thing, we all get it. And all the women will say, oh, you know, I used to have a waist like yours, but, you know, I'm such and such an age, I'm such and such an age, and now I'm a bit, oh, I wish I could wear pretty dresses like that, but I haven't got the figure for it. You know, people say things like that all the time. And, I mean, I was podgy, but I was never big, like overweight, overweight, you know, but I, I was podgy. And, and I started doing a thing where I was like every two weeks I'd take a photo of myself in my black bra and undies just with the camera in the exact same spot. I'm like, let's see what happens here. And it was incredible. Like it's just the podgy, podgy, spongy kind of soft kind of layers just started vanishing and I noticed things started sort of shaping up a little bit and for a while, it was a little bit of kind of loosey skin kind of feeling. Um, it went to a phase where it was podgy, then it was kind of floppy, and then all of a sudden it just went, <laughs> and it just all went back into place like as if I'd been to the gym or something. And I was like, it wasn't until I took a photo. Actually, I, I've used the photo on one of my videos. But I, I just randomly took a selfie of myself in a bikini at the beach and, you know, just propped it up, took it, and then, 
it wasn't until I'd come home and I looked at the photo, I'm like, you look at mine and fine. You know? <laughs> I was like, quite impressed with myself, to be honest with you. I'm like, I'm not doing any sit-ups. I'm doing nothing. I mean, we're walking a lot, but I'd always walked a lot. Nothing had changed in the exercise routine. I love a rowing machine. Um, I'd row a lot and walk a lot, one or the other. I'm always doing something, but it had never helped before. Like, I just did it for physical fitness. So that was amazing to see that sort of transformation. Um, but, again, mainly so, health, yeah. So so I, I really um, i am interested to check. So just to confirm, you've been 10 months now. Yes. Right, yes. 10 months. And so 10 months ago, if you weren't taking your meds, your hands would have been like this and your feet would have been like this. Yep. Yep. Like how is it day to day now? How, sorry? How is it day to day now? Like, I mean, it doesn't oh. look like your hands are like this. I mean, I, I was, I went to a car show yesterday and played saxophone for three hours straight, like, um, on my feet standing up because I don't sit down when I play so um I've started jogging like I can I, you know I used to walk a lot and then I thought I wonder what would happen if I added a little jog here and there um I have no pain anywhere in my body and it's just been I honestly feel like I've I've been given a new life really like it, a second chance at life I'm I'm so thankful. I uh, have not had to take any drugs, not even uh, you know Panadol or anything like that. No, full functionality in all my joints. Um, the nodules that I had, I had rheumatoid nodules around my wrist, which is my rheumatologist had told me. So not, I see a rheumatologist every six months. So not at the last visit, but the visit before. I'd said to her, oh, I'm getting these strange little hard lumps on my hands. You know, what is that? And she said, oh, they're just rheumatoid nodules. Um, I said, well, what do they mean and why am I getting them? She said, oh, it's just a sign of severe rheumatoid arthritis, like because I have seropositive, which is the most severe form, seropositive and sudden onset because it literally hit me overnight is meant to be the worst possible prognosis. So nobody had, you know, any good hope for me really. But these nodules were appearing. That's on the medication, on the medication with nodules. I go back six months later on carnivore, no nodules, gone. And I say, I tell her straight off the bat, I'm, I'm doing carnivore diet. And I, I didn't tell her I wasn't taking the medication because that would be tragic. But she, I said, look, no nodules, no nodules. And she just kind of laughed when I said about carnivore. Like they just don't listen. They're not interested at all, you know. And I'm going to keep telling her, like, you know, that that's that. But um, my doctor actually recommended that I should probably not tell her about not taking the medication because he's still of the mindset, like, if it comes back at some point in the future, it was such a hard road for you to get on that medication in the first place that they, if they knew you're surviving without it, you probably won't get it again. And 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 I don't like having to be that sceptical, you know. But you do wonder, like sometimes when when you've had a chronic illness for as long as I have, you kind of, you know, you might you feel like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop sometimes. And I kept feeling like that for the first sort of six months or so. When I got six months in, I was like, no. I'm I don't feel like rheumatoid is in my body anymore. I had blood tests, lots of blood tests, obviously. My doctor monitored me really closely. There is no inflammation in my body. It has just gone consistently down, 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 down to the point where it's just like a normal human being that's never had any autoimmune condition at all. It is actually lower now at my most recent couple of blood tests. Um, I've been having them every three months. So it's the last couple of blood tests have been lower than they were. Like I'm talking ESR and CRP, which is the inflammatory markers they're looking for in me, are lower than they were when I was on the immunosuppressant biological drugs. Mm. You so, know, how can you argue with that, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, th this is awesome. Um, yeah. I I'm interested to know the reaction of, the doctor, the, the doctor that originally said to you, um, have you tried meat only? 
I mean, what's your doctor's reaction been when when you have gone back a month, two months, three months later and said the it's all gone, nothing? He, he's absolutely wrapped. I mean, he is so happy. We, um, I'm not there at the moment now because I'm in Victoria at the moment, but we had a telehealth consult like a few weeks back and uh, – he is over the moon happy and he's been telling me, like even, even when I was there and, and the results were already coming through from all the tests because, um, you know, just to make sure I was all comfortable, he also sent me off for a CAC um, heart calcium score test um, because, it, you know, with rheumatoid can affect your heart and it can affect your eyes and it affects all sorts of things. Um, and he said, look, just so we've got some kind of baseline here, let's do it now. Um, and it came back as a zero. And he's like, you basically, you know, that's a better predictor of future heart events than even cholesterol readings. He's really good about cholesterol. He says, I'm not even going to test your cholesterol. We did it at the beginning, but he goes, I'm not going to test it with this round of blood tests because it's going to come up high. But it's going to come up high, he said, because basically cholesterol are trains that run around your body delivering lipids to the places where lipids need to be. Now, obviously, you're eating a lot more fats than you used to, so there's going to be more trains running around the place. So if I measure it now, it's going to come up high. And unfortunately, as a doctor, I am duty-bound to suggest statins for you. And so his solution to that was just don't test my cholesterol. <laughs> Gotta love nice. it, right? But he, he was so pleased for me because he'd seen me struggling and depressed and just constantly in his office for years and years and years like he was just he he told me straight off the bat you need to go and tell your story you need to start letting people know because this is uncharted territory those were his actual words uncharted territory that nobody with a case as severe as mine had had such an amazing response and 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 gotten to such a good place as far as all the bright you know markers show and and healing benefits not just you know, physically but mentally as well because, well, they go hand in hand. It's really hard to be a happy human when you're sick, you know. So, um, yeah, no, he's he's cheering me on from the sidelines nonstop, you know. He asked about have you tried adding the things in and I said, oh, I dabbled with that and I have had meals that are non-carnivore um, on rare occasions, like usually in a social setting. I'm so lucky that I'm a reclusive human being that has no social life because, there's just no temptation. <laughs> I mean, I, I can control my diet to a T. But when you do go out, and it's always, let's go out to dinner. Oh, you know, I mean, the first time it happened, it was my ex-husband's birthday, and it, we went to some place for, actually it was lunch, and it was like a surf club up on the Gold Coast. And, you know, I go, oh, they've got steak. That's good. So, okay, can I have the steak? I don't want the vegetables or potatoes. And can you cook it, like, not in oil? Can you cook it in butter? And, and they look at me and they're like, we're not an a la carte type, you know, we're not that kind of place. Like, And I'm like, they said, what, do you have food allergies? And I'd already read this before. Yes, if you say food allergies, they have to do it, right? So I go, yes. What are you allergic to? I go, seed oils. <laughs> I'm allergic to seed oils. It's just cook my steak of she goes well it's the same grill that everything's cool you know things like that would happen quite regularly and then and then I went to pay for it and they were going to charge me the same price as the one that came with the you know the salad and the veggies or the chips or whatever it was and I'm like well screw that like I'll, I'll I'll give me all the salad and the veggies and the chips and I'll just give it to the kids you know so that's <laughs> but there's been other occasions where it's been like it just isn't an option. I mean, I did go out to dinner recently at a pub, which was kind of cool because I asked them, can you cook my steak in butter? Because I noticed they had um, the, the side of vegetables was vegetables cooked in butter. So I'm like, okay, they got butter. So they can cook my steak. And they did, and it was fabulous. So, But that's been not the occasion. So there's been a few times when I've eaten things that are, you know, veggies. I mean, I don't mean I go out and buy a big chocolate cake and eat a bunch of crap. Like, I'm not stupid. But if the if a veggie or, a, you know, something that's been fried or crumbed or whatever comes in and I just go, you know what, for the sake of not being that annoying person that's like, I can't eat this and I can't eat that, I'll just eat whatever you guys are eating, you know. like. Um, and to my absolute pleasant surprise, it has not affected me health-wise whatsoever, the occasional not the right thing. I just come straight back to 
my strict carnivore diet because mentally that makes me feel better. That's the only thing I've really noticed the difference is I just don't feel great after eating something that's not right, you know. So, yeah, it brings me straight back every time and, and I don't imagine that changing ever. And it's so easy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. The amount of shopping I used to have to do, like, oh, what am I going to eat this week? I need this ingredient, that ingredient, that ingredient, or whatever. You know, like, shopping was, and I hate shopping. I, I, I don't even like shopping, like, for girly things. Like, I just don't like shopping at all. It's just a nightmare to me, like, the whole experience. Now I'm like, I go in there, like, I know exactly where to go to get the, the whole scotch fillet, the eggs, the sardines. Maybe a bottle of mineral water because that's a special treat, you know, bubbly water, mm, champagne for me. Uh, that's my special shopping treat. Um, butter, eggs, steak, lamb chops, lamb chops in between the steak because I just mix it up a bit. Shopping's done in five minutes and mm. I'm out the door with the same products nice. every time. Yeah, so easy. And how, how often are you eating in a day? That has so changed over the course of this whole journey and I'm very adaptable to that. I am I kind of didn't feel comfortable with the whole intermittent fasting window of opportunity type situation, mainly because I am healing, you know. I'm not necessarily, uh, there's damage in here, you know. I need, I need as much nutrients as I can get into me basically. So I really just eat when I'm hungry. Um, but having said that, you know, as you get into the carnivore more and, and, and adapt fully, you just, your hunger sing signals aren't firing off every five seconds because your body's not screaming for carbs and sugar every five seconds. You know, you're like, oh, I just got a really nutritious, satisfying meal. I had a steak for breakfast. Like, I'm eating steak for breakfast. <laughs> That's so weird to me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, and then I might not be hungry. And when I say breakfast, I don't actually eat till about midday. Like, so I guess in a kind of way I've veered off into what would be classed as intermittent fasting now because that's just when my hunger single just, you know. But having said that, like, yesterday morning I had to wake up at 5.30 to go to a car show and I ate my eggs when I got, got there. I took the caravan with me, by the way, so the kitchen that comes with me everywhere I go, which is kind of handy. <laughs> so, And I've got, like, a solar power pack thing and I'm there cooking up scrambled eggs at the car show before it officially opened so and that was about nine o'clock in the morning because I knew I'd be going all day and I probably you know might get hungry so I preemptively ate even though I wasn't really hungry so I have that you know usually I, I'm a bit of a creature of habit and people always talk about variety like what about variety don't you get bored you do not get bored when nutrition is all you, food becomes, food is not a social occasion. It's not a, it's not a indulgence for me. It's nutrition. I need to feed the machine, you know. So, I cook up usually because I get the whole Scotch fillet and I'll slice that as I use it. Um, and because you know, once you open it, you've got to use it within a, you know, a few days. Really, I'll cook two steaks at a time, big ones, probably three hundred gram steak. So if I cook it, they in, in the evening, I'll have the steak for dinner that day and then the other one goes in the fridge and it'll be breakfast the next day. And if I have the steak at, you know, around midday-ish, this is, it's kind of midday, five o'clock-ish is kind of when my body gets, I'm really hungry. Uh, and so it's either the eggs in the morning, the steak in the evening or the lamb chops in the evening, or if I've had the steak earlier on in the day, then I do the eggs later on in the day. Um, and in between those things and not necessarily every day but if i do feel like mm, i'm a bit hungry then it's a tin of sardines and spring water and um, i actually did just make a video about what i'm eating in an average day uh, i just haven't posted it yet because i had so much other stuff going on in my life but yeah that that's pretty much it so two to three times a day i guess is the answer to that mm. Mm. okay nice so speaking of the videos um could you could you uh, tell us two things? Could you tell us where Wanderous comes from, and um, and uh, also tell us about your channel? Okay, so Wanderous comes from a book. Um, oh, I'm going to feel terrible for not remembering his name now because we actually did communicate for a while via messages when I was living in America. Roman Payne, that's his name, he wrote a book called The Wanderers. 
And it's about this woman. Um, she's a very sort of elusive nature girl and she just, you know, wanders around and it's very kind of very poetic and lyrical and, um, yeah, he's quite a poet. So, and there's one, there's one uh, quote from the book and it says something along the lines of, she was a wanderer. She belonged to no city and to no man um, and that she flowed like a drop of river, water down the river or I don't know. It's just this beautiful thing about, you know, just being this free-flowing type of person who belongs to no city and no man and I'm like, that's me. <laughs> so that's where that came from, yeah. And my channel is basically about that, the fact that I just float around um, I'm a full-time nomad in, in my caravan. I'm actually technically a homeless person, but nomad sounds way cooler. <laughs> I got put on disability and life changed a lot for me as far as my income and my business. And, you know, I've struggled a lot with mental and physical health and life got tough. So I, I kind of saw that that was the direction it was going and I bought myself a little old caravan and I couldn't afford a you know a fancy caravan. So I bought the cheapest caravan I could find and I slowly have done it up and up, you know, over the years that I've had it and just been traveling around mainly because there's nowhere to, that I can afford to stay on a permanent basis as far as a house or I can't buy a house. I can't even rent a house. I mean, you know what it's like here in Australia at the moment and pretty much in the world, I think, that the housing crisis is biting really hard. And I guess I just got a little bit ahead of that because I've been doing this for four and a half years now full time in my caravan. So at first it was just a, I really feel sorry for myself because life sucks and this is really hard. And I just started making these videos. I really don't know why, to be honest with you. I felt like I was this invisible human having a human experience that nobody would ever know. And, I, you know, being a former journalist, I have a tendency to record every moment of my life anyway. Um, and it is a it's just a, it's just my crazy adventure of life like the ups the downs the struggles the good times the beautiful things I see and people I meet and it's just you know come along it's not a, it's no one particular subject matter I'm also a saxophone busker that's how I get a little bit of extra money from time to time I'll set my gear up on the side of the street somewhere and, and get extra money from saxophone busking. So there's a bit of that. You know, there's a few things about my carnivore journey. I do want to add more to that, but I've just had a lot going on, as I always do. Like, it's um, it's just my crazy life. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So um, from all your traveling around, what what's your favorite part of Australia? I do get asked that question a lot, don't I? It's so hard to answer that because I it depends on my mood. Like if I want to be by the beach, um, I really enjoyed parts of the central coast, New South Wales. Just the beaches are amazing. Like I was spent time up there recently and I was like, why is this place not like Byron Bay? Like Byron Bay is a beautiful beach, but it's inundated with tourists and just too peoply for me. I really I like places that aren't like uh, – not touristy. I, I like places with less people. Um, my absolute favourite place at the moment, where I am at the moment, is the kind of place where most of my friends and family kind of go, why? Um, I'm at northwest Victoria. It's flat and, and vast as far as the eye can see. It's kind of like the Kansas of Australia. It's just, you know, there's just, I don't know what it is, but when I'm driving on those roads and, and I'm just, the road is definitely my favorite place in the world. Like being on a road from destination A to destination B, um, I, I never ever get bored of it. Even on a road that other people would think is boring, it's just endlessly fascinating to me. Just, just I don't know, changing scenery and the lights. And Australia has this beautiful golden glow thing that happens. You know, it's just got a kind of a I don't see that anywhere else in the world. And I've traveled a lot of places around the world and I've traveled all around America. I mean, America is a really beautiful, scenic, spectacular looking country. It's amazing for road tripping, probably better than Australia. Australia, we have a lot more of this sort of sameness. But, you know, I, I, I sometimes I want mountains and waterfalls and rivers and um, forests. 
Sometimes I just want big, dry, flat plains as far as the eye can see. Sometimes I might want to hang by the beach. I couldn't name a geographical location, to be honest with you, because it's just it's just about, I don't know, nature. <laughs> Anything the, there, is, there is something really nice as well about, as you say, that driving just one place to another. I've, like I've driven occasionally like, you know, Gold Coast to Melbourne or yeah. along along the coast or, yeah. um, you know, Brisbane to Port Macquarie, things like that. And yeah. the big open roads and just being able to drive and not having to worry about traffic jams and stuff like that, right? it, it's awesome, yeah. right? No traffic lights. No, no. The Great Ocean Road, as far as top drives go, Great Ocean Road is definitely up there for me. I've done it a couple of times and it's just one of those moments where you just come around the corner and you're like, oh, wow. Oh wow! Oh wow! You know, like beautiful, beautiful road. Yeah, I, I, I do. I've actually just did the coast road down. I came down in, um, I think I left Queensland in October, and uh, spent like I came down really slow because normally I'm racing up and down too quickly, and I was like, I'm just going to take it really slow. And normally I don't do the coast roads. I usually do the inland routes because it's cheaper to camp mainly. Um, and I just assumed that the coast road would be too touristy and whatever, but it depends on what time you do it, you know. So I get off the road, no, De December, January, I don't travel. I stop. I, I sit somewhere quietly and let everyone else go caravanning, you know, like Christmas holiday time is madness out there. Caravan parks are crazy busy, roads are crazy busy, and I don't want to deal with it. So I kind of wait until they've all done their thing, and then I, I've only just really just gotten back on the road. Um, yeah, I've just come back from my first big road trip since my car and caravan broke down. But that's a whole saga. You'll have to tune into my channel to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to get to your channel, we just got a Lisa Wanderers. That's Is it. That right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll link to that in the description. And um, it's a it, it's a pleasure to have you on and hear um, your journey. I'm, I'm so glad you're doing you're doing so well, Lisa. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling really good. When it, it's so nice to be able to answer that question when people say, "How are you doing?" You go, "I'm actually really great," you know, and really mean it. You know, sometimes we say, "How are you?" You know, someone says, "How are you?" And you go, "Yeah, good, thanks. How are you?" You, you know, it's that stock standard response. No, I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm doing really great. Yeah, life is good. Lisa, how did you find? Lisa, hang on a second. 